an active member of this committee and someone who has spotlighted this behavior and this issue from the time AmericanJobCreators.com became directly aware of it. Today's hearing is about the effect that NLRB's Acting General Counsel's decision to bring suit against Boeing, the Boeing Company is having on thousands of jobs in South Carolina. It is the fundamental responsibility of the National Labor Relations Board to protect the rights of employees and employers and to prevent practices that will harm the general welfare of workers, businesses, and the U.S. economy. It is this chair's opinion that on all of these points, NRB action may have failed. The jobs of thousands of workers at what is today a non-union worksite in South Carolina are at risk. <clears throat> the investment Boeing put into South Carolina facility, valued at more than $1 billion, is now in jeopardy. And production of portions of 835 planes, most of which will be exported, that have already been ordered, is now in jeopardy. Timely delivery is essential, and without this facility, it is unlikely commitments will be met. <clears throat> and finally, Mr. Solomon's decision, which has been described in ways that I'm going to leave out of my opening statement, could in fact lead to rep rep repercussions in Americans' competitiveness and in decisions by other businesses to locate in right-to-work states or in fact co foreign companies to locate in America at all. Often when you believe that you're helping one party, you may be hurting the party you you're intend to help. Seattle's economy, which is very good in aerospace, may be hurt by decisions not to allow new facilities be put there in the future for fear that they could not be expanded on in the future in other areas. As an entrepreneur and business owner myself, I know well the decision-making process that goes into decisions about where to locate a plant warehouse, when to hire employees, and what to invest to grow your company and jobs. Evidence suggests Boeing's decision to build the new assembly plant in South Carolina was simply an act of managerial discretion and not an effort to discourage employees from engaging <coughs> in protective activities, protected activities under the National Labor Relations Act. If Boeing's actions were lawful and proper, and made on the basis of multiple factors and in the best interest of the company, its workers, and the people of South Carolina, then why has the NLRB acting general counsel sued them? Moreover, how can the president expect the private sector to, to create jobs and put Americans back to work if his appointees continue to use regular, the regulatory process to keep putting impediments in their path? Why would the administration stand in the way of reindustrialization re of the American workforce and strengthening one of the major industries where we still have a competitive global advantage? Any appearance, <coughs> that, mis or see, any appearance that Mr. Solomon's decision was tailored to reward the President's powerful financial and political supporters, big labor would be disturbing. The American people deserve to know if so-called independent regulatory agencies are ex exceeding their legal authority to pursue a partisan agenda. And finally, I want to make the point about the difficulty the committee had in securing Mr. Solomon as a witness. Fortunately, he is here today, and for that, I thank you. But he is here because of a compulsory process. <clears throat> and I am increasingly concerned that the, the use of subpoena, which has not been historically needed, may be a sign that there is a constitutional challenge forming between the Congress's legitimate oversight and the executive branch, including their quasi-independent uh, agencies. And with that, I recognize the gentlelady from New York for her opening statement. Thank, thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. and I. Uh thank all my colleagues for being here. It's uh, wonderful to be in South Carolina, in Charleston, and welcome to all of our witnesses. <clears throat> we, we are gathered here today at a time when employment is the most crucial issue facing our country. 
Roughly 13 and a half million Americans are unemployed. The labor force participation rate is still at a low, not seen in over a generation. The focus of our inquiry today should be how Republicans and Democrats can work together to encourage businesses to invest and put Americans back to work in South Carolina and elsewhere in this country. This case is not about creating jobs in South Carolina. This case is not about Everett Washington workers against Charleston workers. This case is about a company thinking it is above the law because it is a multi-billion dollar multinational corporation. If Boeing moved jobs into a non-union factory 10 miles down the road from its Everett plant, because workers have protested working conditions, its decision would be just as illegal. But that is not why we are here. Instead, this hearing actually concerns the economic consequences of a potential illegal act allegedly committed by the Boeing Company and the, and the legitimate law enforcement action taken this week by the National Labor Relations Board to sanction it. At issue in the Boeing case is whether Boeing illegally retaliated against American workers for engaging in activity that Congress has chosen to protect since 1935 and FDR, the right to protest. No worker benefits for allowing a company to explicitly break the law, just as it is illegal to discriminate against workers based on their race or gender. It is also illegal to make business decisions that discriminate against workers for exercising their legal rights. The protected rights at stake in the Boeing case apply to workers regardless of whether or not they are unionized, whether or not they live in South Carolina or anywhere in our great nation and, of course, regardless of politics. Boeing is a very important company to our country. With its workers, they make outstanding products. They export. Uh, they are our biggest exporter. I support creating great jobs and reducing unemployment across the United States, but I also believe that Boeing is not above the law. And as members of Congress, we should not set aside the law to give preferred treatment to any one company. The NLRB is part of our justice system, and it should be given the opportunity to do justice in the Boeing case. That is the only way to ensure that all workers, even those here working for Boeing in South Carolina, are protected. <laughs> That is why I'm very concerned about the timing of this hearing and the chairman's insistence on it and his insistence that Mr. LaFay Solomon, the general counsel and chief prosecutor of the case, just testify while the Boeing hearing is currently underway. His testimony today raises serious concerns about the due process rights of litigants and the integrity of the Boeing proceedings. Mr. Chairman, as you know, I am a strong believer in the importance of congressional oversight, but I do not believe that we should interfere with active prosecutions under the guise of oversight. <clears throat> we must act prudently and respect the judicial process. I hope that you will exercise your discretion as chair of the committee and direct the members today to avoid asking questions of Mr. Solomon, which could in any way put uh, a fair trial and due process at risk. If you do not, I believe you may, intentionally or not, permit the uh, legal process to be tainted by political interference. This simply does not serve any legitimate goal of this committee or the United States Congress. If, however, you take steps to protect the integrity of the legal process and prevent interference, then I am confident that today's hearing can shed some light on how to ensure that all workers 
whether in South Carolina or anywhere else in our great country, can find employment and continue to have the ability to bargain for rights and engage in protected activity. Uh, today, the middle class is in serious decline with wages for the majority of workers stagnant and increasing numbers of workers without access to health insurance and pension benefits. There is no question that unions have contributed to building the middle class in our country. For instance, according to the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics, union workers are more likely than non-union workers to be covered for health insurance and receive pension benefits and paid sick leave. We cannot ignore the critical role that unions have played in building America by helping improve the wages and working conditions of union and non-union jobs alike. In closing, I, I want to emphasize again that this hearing puts at risk trying to use politics to influence the work of an independent federal agency. To intimidate is to affect the outcome of a judicial proceeding. This is very dangerous to our democracy. If we believe in the rules of law, we have to be governed by due process institutions have created to resolve these issues in a fair manner. Again, I thank you for yielding to me and for calling this hearing. I thank the gentlelady. We now represent leadership in this in this area. I also want to thank my colleagues, those that are in the audience, our colleagues from state government, uh, Speaker of our House, uh, Attorney General uh, Henry Brown, who served so ably in Congress for many years. Uh, my two colleagues who are on the dais with me, Representative Wilson, Representative Scott, and we speak on behalf of those uh, of our colleagues who are not here. Uh, with that in mind, Mr. Chairman, I would uh, ask unanimous consent to place uh, two letters from our uh, Senator, Senator Graham and Senator DeMint, uh, into the record. I have them without objection, so ordered. Mr. Chairman, the purpose of the National Labor Relations Act is to promote the full flow of commerce, to prescribe the legitimate rights of both employees and employers in their relations affecting commerce, and to protect the rights of the public in connection with labor disputes affecting commerce. In other words, the NLRA is supposed to strike a proper balance between the rights of employees, employers, and the public. But you would never know that from the actions of the NLRB. Under the guise of enforcing the NLRA, the NLRB has essentially become a sycophant for labor unions. At a time when union membership is at a historic low, the NLRB seeks to give unions a historically unprecedented level of influence. Exhibit A is the NLRB's recent interaction with the state of South Carolina. Not only did the NLRB threaten to sue the state of South Carolina for seeking to memorialize in our Constitution something as revolutionary as the right to a secret ballot, <clears throat> this administration, not content with class warfare, not content with generational warfare, now seeks to engage in regional warfare, pitting workers in Washington state against those who seek jobs in South Carolina. Boeing has made airplanes in Washington for several decades. And during the course of that time, there have been at least four work stoppages which threatened Boeing's ability to deliver airplanes to customers in a timely fashion. So Boeing did what any responsible company would do. It looked to see where best to start a new, separate, distinct line of work on the 787 Dreamliner. The union didn't like that, and they found a willing ally in the NLRB. The NLRB filed a complaint against Boeing and lay aside the demonstrably false allegations of the complaint, lay aside the unprecedented legal analysis. The NLRB wants to make Boeing shut down its South Carolina facility, get rid of the 1,000 employees that have been hired, and return the work to Washington State. The spokesperson for the NLRB is quoted as saying this, we're not telling Boeing they can't build planes in South Carolina. We're talking about one specific plane, three planes a month. If they keep those planes, those three planes a month in Washington State, there is no problem. Let that sink in for a second. An unelected executive branch entity spokesperson is telling a private company what it can make, where it can make it, and how much of it it can make. According to the reasoning of the NLRB, it is fine for a new company to consider wage rates, work stoppages, and take the full panoply of factors into consideration in deciding whether to pick a union state or a right-to-work state. But a company who has already planted a flag in a union state
cannot dare consider starting a new line of work in a right to work state. And make no mistake, this is a new line of work. Not one single employee has lost a job in Washington State. Not one single employee has suffered an adverse consequence as a result of Boeing's decision to start a separate distinct line of work in South Carolina. Despite congressional intent and clear Supreme Court jurisprudence, union leadership and unelected NLRB attorneys are now seeking to become managing partners in the business affairs of American companies. South Carolina is confident Boeing will be vindicated in a court of law. However, the NLRB's jurisdictional overreach coupled with its brazen activism threatens the future allocation of work by American companies. South Carolinians want to work, Mr. Chairman. We need the jobs. We want to meet our familiar and societal obligations. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. We now recognize the gentlelady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Norton, for her opening statement. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I wish I could uh, uh, say to my good friend, the Chairman, that I'm pleased that he's called today's hearing. Well, I'm pleased to have you here. <laughs> but, Mr. Chairman, today's hearing makes unfortunate history. Uh, with an unprecedented appearance of an abuse of the rule of law uh, and constitutional due process. Congress has obligatory oversight uh, responsibilities over the National Labor Relations Board and the National Labor Relations Act, but when it threatens to issue a compulsory subpoena uh, of decision-making counsel in the middle of a legal proceeding, it lends an appearance of intimidation. Among other subjects, I have taught labor law at George, as a tenured professor of law at Georgetown University Law School and know of the difficulty of, uh, and close calls of these fact-laden cases and of the pains Congress took to create an independent general counsel and an independent board to avoid the appearance of seeking to influence the outcome of a legal proceeding while it is in progress and before any decision on the merits has been made. How else to interpret actions by members of the House and Senate, including, uh, uh, including threatening subpoenas, demanding the privileged work product of counsel, and threatening to defund the essential court here, the National Labor Relations Board, before it has made a decision or even heard the case. I may be a member of Congress, but I am still a member in good standing of the bar uh, and an officer of the court. I have no basis for a judgment on the merits of the ongoing proceeding in my role as a member of Congress, and I will not use this hearing to try to influence the outcome. I hope that following this hearing, this committee may once again embrace the long tradition of Republican and Democratic chairmen alike to avoid the possibility of appearing to taint a legal proceeding by engaging in a hearing while the proceeding is ongoing. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentlelady. We now recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. <coughs> Farinold, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's good to be in uh, South Carolina. Uh, I'm here as a member of the Government Oversight and Reform Committee and also as a concerned Texan, a, a state that, like Car um, South Carolina, has worked hard to create a business-friendly environment with low taxes, reasonable regulations, and a, and a great workforce and a great place to live. Governor Perry uh, and the legislature in the state of Texas uh, have done worked hard to do create much the same environment and these issues that affect South Carolina uh, affect a whole lot of other states as well in fact uh, the state of Texas Attorney General Abbott along with 16 other attorney generals have uh, filed an amicus brief in in this proceeding and we've got states like uh, Alabama Arizona Florida Georgia Idaho Kansas Nebraska Oklahoma South Dakota Utah Virginia and Wyoming and they were also joined by uh, non-right-to-work states like Colorado and Michigan. I think this is a, a telling feature because this decision could have huge potential impact on economic development. And right-to-work states would create an environment where uh, 
companies are afraid to create new lines of business and expand into those states. And in states that uh, are non-right-to-work states, it creates the impression that, wow, we don't want to start up in those states because as we grow, we're stuck in those kind of states. And that is absolutely the wrong thing for the federal government to be doing, telling private businesses where they can and cannot locate, where they can and cannot grow their business. We are in a climate right now in this uh, government where regulatory and quasi-regulatory agencies are out really trying to stop growth. I, I, I'm deeply concerned that there's a concerted effort on the part of this administration and its regulatory agencies to punish states that have different philosophies than they do, that believe in balanced budgets, that believe in lower taxes, and b believe businesses are the place to create jobs for people. And this is a dangerous precedent that is being set, and that is one of the reasons uh, we are here today. It's not trying to influence the outcome of something. It's trying to say it never should have been started in the first place. Thank you very much. I, I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Cleveland, Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, for his opening statement. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to associate myself with the remarks of uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton uh, with respect to uh, this procedure. Um, I trust the chair will take into account our concerns and that will conduct himself accordingly. But, but I am concerned that the uh, workers' rights, which the NRB have decided have been um, uh, violated uh, by Boeing, would be further violated through any infringement on right to due process, equal, equal protection of the law, right to fair trial, uh, through these proceedings. But again, that's in the hands of the chair. The question that faces us uh, at its core, did Boeing unlawfully retaliate against its Washington state workers who were lawfully exercising their right to strike? Boeing's executive vice president, Jim uh, Alba, told the Seattle Times when speaking of a move, Quote, the overriding factor was not the business climate, and it was not the wages we're paying people today. It was that we can't afford to have a work stoppage every three years. Unquote. Boeing planned to transfer jobs away from Washington State and a unionized workforce in the Seattle area to a non-union facility in South Carolina. The National Labor Relations Board found that Boeing violated the National Labor Relations Act when it made coercive statements and it threatened its employees for engaging in legally protected activities, strikes, and for transferring work from uh, the same workforce in order to avoid the possibility of those workers engaging in protected activity in the future. <coughs> uh, there are 3,300 people currently working on the 787 Dreamliner in Everett. There are, this operation is supposed to scale down as the uh, South Carolina plan is fully operational. But the scaling down is, in effect, a transfer of work, which has uh, been correctly identified as retaliatory uh, in violation of the National Labor Relations Act. Uh, I would say that it's not the NLRB, but it's Boeing that has pitted one state against the other. It's Boeing that's pitting one group of workers against another at a time of great economic uncertainty and at a time when corporate profits generally are rising during a jobless recovery. I want to say, Mr. Chairman, I respect my colleagues on the other side of the aisle who are here fighting for their constituents. I respect that. That's what you're supposed to do. And that, you know, but we, we have a, a, a deeper question here. And that is, um, did Boeing violate uh, the law? A and if it did, uh, are there remedies available to the workers under, under that law? And if the answer comes to be that it did, uh, then uh, the remedies that are put to Boeing uh, it, it would, you know, it'd be unfortunate if the people in South Carolina would have to suffer, but Boeing is going to have to have that on their uh, account because this is something that, that really relates to what the law is. And finally, uh, Mr. Chairman, Boeing, uh, I, I think we ought to be concerned about keeping jobs in this country. And it's inevitable that Boeing is going to have to consider calling work back from overseas when they outsource it and increase the production mm -hmm. curve of their, uh, and the delivery curve of their, uh, of their Dreamliner. So we want the work to come back, and we want to make sure that uh, workers everywhere have a chance to participate in a renewed American manufacturing climate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, pursuant to our rules, we'll next go to Mr. Brady as a member of the committee. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like you all to look at the seal behind the chairman. 
because it has what the people of the county of Charleston felt were important principles to promote when they formed this government. And you'll see up there, pro bono public, for the public good. And unfortunately, this hearing misses the point that the purpose of a National Labor Relations Board investigation is to determine what's in the public good when the NLRB exercises its constitutional responsibility to investigate whether labor laws have been violated, in this case, by Boeing, and if so, what a proper remedy for those violations should be. And if you remember only one thing, you need to think about not just what due process means to the parties to this complaint, but what it means to you and your families and your friends and your neighbors. Because this goes much deeper than an NLRB hearing. And the problem with this hearing is it involves an unprecedented improper interference by Congress with a pending adjudicative proceeding as defined by the federal statute and based on years of precedent. So what we should be talking about is not what the uh, person who is in charge of prosecuting that case is doing, but whether in fact Boeing broke the law and what should be an appropriate remedy. One of the things that you learn in your first days of class in, ad in administrative laws is that administrative agencies act in one of two ways. One is by rulemaking, where there's an opportunity for expansive public input and congressional input, and all of us engage in that on a constant basis. But the other type of action by agencies is called adjudication, and it's just like a judicial proceeding. And just as you aren't supposed to tamper with juries, who are deciding the facts in a case in a court, you aren't supposed to tamper with witnesses who appear in front of that court even though they aren't involved in the process of deciding the outcome of that case. So what we should be talking about is things that are the basis of our Constitution and how this country is founded. Let me read this to you. He has obstructed the administration of justice by refusing his assent to laws for establishing judicial powers. He has made judges dependent on his will alone for the tenure of their offices and the amount and payment of their salaries. That's in our Declaration of Independence because our founding fathers didn't want people interviewing with judicial processes, which is what was happening in England. And that's why when we're talking and the chairman mentions the threat to the reindustrialization of the American workforce, folks, we're involved in a race to the bottom right now. We had 397,000 factories in this country at the beginning of the last decade. We only have 343,000 now. That's a closure of 54,000 factories, a loss of 5 million jobs. That means every day 15 factories are shutting down. That's what we should be talking about today. I thank the gentleman. We now go to another favorite son here, Mr. Joe Wilson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this North Charleston <coughs> hearing. Uh, indeed, uh, this is unprecedented. Uh, what we're talking about is an unprecedented expansion of big government determining where companies can locate their uh, operations and employ uh, citizens. Uh, but more importantly, right here, uh, what we have is a, an assault on Boeing which kills jobs in South Carolina. And this is an issue very important, obviously, to the families of South Carolina, but it's important to all the people of the United States. I'm really grateful to be here uh, in that this is my birthplace, Charleston, America's historic city. I uh, am very grateful that uh, the people who will be working with Boeing are going to be uh, working in a world-class community. That's why they've come here. And to be here with Congressman Tim Scott, who is the resident member of Congress, uh, we have our workhorse, uh, former member of Congress, Henry Brown, Speaker of the House, uh, Bobby Harrell, is here. Uh, the leadership of this community has just been so proactive uh, creating jobs. Uh, Charleston is such a fitting location for this hearing, Mr. Chairman, in that this is the home of Governor Jim Edwards. Uh, it was his leadership uh, that recruited Michelin to South Carolina. We now have uh, the North American headquarters in Greenville here in South Carolina. We have seven plants across South Carolina. In fact, in the district I represent in Lexington, over a billion dollars. Uh, has been invested since 1979, creating thousands of jobs. Uh, so we have a record of recruiting industry. And of course, to be here at the Port of Charleston, uh, it, this is a tribute to former Governor Carol Campbell. Uh, he recruited BMW. 
And right here from Charleston, over a million BMWs have been exported around the world. Um, and so it's a real tribute. The reason that people and companies locate in South Carolina is that uh, we have a capable, productive workforce. We have a world-class technical college system. We have a welcoming climate. Uh, it's a meteorological climate that's mild. You can do business year-round, uh, and the people are warm. Uh, we're a right-to-work state that protects the rights of workers. And we have pro-business uh, leadership in government uh, with Speaker Harrell, with the Senate President, Glenn McConnell, uh, Democrats, Republicans working together, supportive of this uh, expansion of Boeing to South Carolina. We welcome this and I look forward uh, to the testimony today. But the people of South Carolina are so supportive of creating jobs and creating opportunity for the uh, families of South Carolina. Thank you. Mr. Scott, we now ask you to top all of those openings. Here, here. <laughs> <laughs> Since this is your town, you're recognized. Thank you, sir. Uh, I'd like to start off by simply saying Thank God for South Carolina, the home of common sense and the permanent home of the Boeing Corporation, number one. Number two, it is obvious that the campaign season has begun. There is no question that we are in the process of seeing the beginning of a presidential re-election campaign as we find ways to fill the coffers in an attempt to use union workers and their dues as a way to create a winning combination for a presidential campaign. Number three, on the issue of politics of intimidation. Think of this, if you will. America's greatest exporter being brought to task not for the elimination of a single union job in Washington state, but for the addition, the increase, the creation of jobs, a thousand jobs in South Carolina. Now think of, it, think of this for just a minute. Uh, the definition of intimidation is having the NLRB require the Boeing Corporation to spend hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, defending a baseless lawsuit, a baseless complaint. Uh, imagine, if you will, the workers in Washington State, as they see 2,000 new employees since the announcement of the North Charleston plant, 2,000 new employees show up for work. That does not sound like retaliation. Think, if you will, that here in Charleston, North Charleston, we've had a billion dollar investment by the Boeing Corporation, and now, and now, we find ourselves having a complaint to be issued to solve a problem that simply does not exist. Why are we here today? How did we get here? In America's fragile recovery, uh, during the midst of one of the most amazing recessions, at the verge of a double dip in the recession, we find ourselves telling the Boeing Corporation that they ought to have figured out how to take these jobs to another country. Because make no mistake that the beginning of a intrastate war, interstate war between Washington and South Carolina, between right to work states and union present states, we find ourselves having a really important conversation. And the conversation is not about right to work versus not the right to work. It's not about Washington State or South Carolina as it has been teed up. It is truly about whether or not we want American corporations doing business in America. Or, or do we want to send more jobs to China? Do, do we in fact want the laws of our country to dictate the success of America's greatest corporations? Or do we want other, other nations to decide and to determine the workforce of America? This entire process is baseless. We find ourselves in the midst of a hearing that should not be. I do agree with that. Because if there was something warranted in this process, we should have addressed it. But simply said, this is a baseless complaint. We find ourselves in the midst of the campaign season. Using your tax dollars, using your tax dollars, in an unprecedented way to tell 
private companies where and how to create jobs. It's interesting that the seven planes that they are producing in Washington State, none of those jobs are moving. Those seven planes will be coming out. They have decided that they want an additional three planes a month. They looked far and wide, and they decided that the greatest workforce in all of America, here in North Charleston, would be the place to have it. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Albeit a little long, you did top everyone else. <laughs> <laughs> I would now ask unanimous consent that the statements of Meredith Boeing Sr. and Dennis Burry, two of the South Carolinian based Boeing employees who sought to intervene in this case involving Boeing Company, uh, the International Association of Machin Machinists, and the NLRB, uh, be entered into the record. Without objection, so ordered. I'll now introduce our panel of witnesses. Oh, additionally, I'd ask unanimous consent that all members, both present and those who may join us, would have seven business days in order to put additional uh, statements and extraneous material into the record. Without objection, so ordered. <coughs> we now recognize our first panel of witnesses. M Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, would you let me okay, get, get them through before any points of order? Okay, I won't start you. without it. Uh, Mr. Yes. Thank you. Mr. Uh, Philip, uh, Ms. Ms. Kamara, Ms. Kamara. Ms. Kamara is a partner at Morgan Lewis and Bar Arcus? Bacchius. Bacchius, <laughs> LLP. And you specialize in labor and employment practices in Chicago, Illinois. Mr. Neil Whitman is president of Dunhill Staffing Systems in Charleston, South Carolina, specializing in staffing. Mr. Julius G. Getman is the Regent Chair at the University of Texas at Austin School of Law. Ms. Cynthia Raymaker is an employee of the Boeing Company in North Charleston, but is testifying today as an employee, uh, sorry, as an individual and not on behalf of the company. And Mr. LeFay Solomon is the acting general counsel of the National Labor Relations Board. And I didn't miss anyone, so before we have anything else, pursuant to the rules, I would ask all witnesses to rise to take uh, the oath. Please right, raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give in this case will be the in this hearing will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I don't think it is. Let the record reflect that all answered the affirmative. Please have a seat. Does the gentlelady have a uh, point of order? Yeah, yes, Mr. Chairman. Please uh, state your point of order. I do have a, a parliamentary inquiry. Parliament. Please state your inquiry. And, and I, I would uh, like to articulate a concern and that I expressed in my opening statement as did Mrs. Norton and Mr. Kucinich about the potential damage this hearing could have on the National Labor Relations uh, Board action against Boeing, which is currently uh, being heard by a judge as we sit here today. My concern echoed a letter that the ranking member of the Oversight uh, Committee, uh, Mr. Cummings, and the ranking member of the Committee on Education and the Workforce, uh, Mr. Miller, sent you yesterday. And I'd like uh, unanimous. Uh, it will be placed in the record. I have a copy of it. I thank you for your inquiry. And I, I am hoping that you can inform us how you intend to proceed with, with the hearing today. Specifically, do you intend to protect the NLRB legal proceedings from political interference today by directing committee members to limit all questions to Mr. Solomon to general questions about the NLRB and its processes and not? ask questions directly related to the NLRB proceedings. Uh, yeah, I will try to answer the gentlelady's questions, the ranking member's questions, the letters coming both from the White House and multiple committees. Uh, and I'll do it in the following fashion. Uh, Mr. Solomon, I'd like to ask you a few questions uh, related specifically to your role here today to make clear what is in and not in bounds. Hopefully we can do that on the record. First of all, is it correct that you were here not pursuant to a subpoena, but in fact voluntarily after the subpoena was issued, there was an acquiescence of your being here? Is that roughly the truth? Or Sir, the, uh, truth? the subpoena was not issued. It was issued. It, 
uh, we it was signed but uh, our understanding is when the staff informed that a subpoena would compel that uh, there was an agreement outside of the subpoena for your appearance voluntarily um, I didn't know there was uh, a signed subpoena. Perfect. I, so, I, so therefore, you're here voluntarily. I am here voluntarily. Okay. Well, that, that's even better. So you're here voluntarily. Do you feel intimidated by us uh, asking you questions related to decisions you have already made? I am here reluctantly, not because I have anything to hide, but because I have a lot to protect. I need to protect the office, the independence of the Office of General Counsel. I need to protect the due process rights of the litigants, and I need to ensure that there is a fair trial. Now, you're not the administrative law judge. Correct. And you've already made your mind up in this case or you wouldn't have brought the case. Is that correct? I certainly issued the complaint. However, I am still actively involved in making strategic decisions about the litigation right. as it continues. It is our intent not to ask you as to your strategy of pursuit in this case against Boeing in which it is our belief correct me if I'm outright wrong you've already made your decision they're guilty or you wouldn't have brought this your strategy may change but you made you alone made were the one person that made the decision to put this before an administrative law judge and therefore you had made a decision is that correct this isn't a fact-finding go fishing you've made a decision and you're prosecuting a case I made a decision that there was reasonable cause to believe the National Mr. Labor Chairman, Relations the Act had been violated. Yeah, if you could, uh, I apologize. Uh, perhaps you can, because of the nature of these mics, I think they're picking up okay, but if you'd speak up just a little whenever possible. Certainly, sir. Um, I believed after a thorough investigation that there was reasonable cause to believe that the National Labor Relations Act had been violated. I authorized the issuance of a complaint, uh, but you know, as I said, I am actively involved in in going forward and uh, determining the strategy of our litigation. Okay. And you're aware of precedent in which Congress has independently made decisions about all activities of the executive branch, whether direct or through a quasi-independent agency. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. I am unaware of any time a general counsel of the National Labor Relations Board has been called before Congress in a pending litigation. Uh, you are aware that the Congress has from time to time convened, offered laws restraining even the federal court and certainly the executive branch from certain actions which they disagreed with. Is that correct? I, I am no legal scholar in, in Fortunately, we call. have one here. I'm sure he'll, he'll <laughs> pipe in at the appropriate time. Okay, then I will issue guidance pursuant to the gentlelady's request. We believe, I, the chair believes and will rule that questions related to that which you have already decided, but not related to the strategy you will pursue in the pending case are inbounds. Facts which are entitled to be received by the defendant and others will be considered reasonable to ask for any item which is not discoverable by the defendant will be considered out of bounds for any question. Uh, the clock will stop if at any time individuals on either side ask a question in which you wish to seek or believe you need to seek your counsel. Uh, unless your counsel is sworn, he won't be able to answer for you, but he will be available to you and you will have it whatever time you want or, or whatever time you need. <coughs> Additionally, it is not our intent to interfere with the process ongoing. Congress has an independent right to make a decision to change the outcome. We could eliminate the NLRB. We could choose to take mm -hmm. your premise and statutorily change it. That is part of the consideration that Congress has to make, and we have to make it in real time. Uh, this is not something we can wait till three years from now. Uh, plus, we have amicus uh, uh, possibilities at any appropriate time. We will limit our questions to that decision which you have made and that which would be otherwise discoverable and nothing beyond that. Is that understood and do you agree? Uh, yes, I think we might need to play it out a bit before I understand it. They give me a gavel so that I can make additional <laughs> statements and rulings as appropriate. Is the gentlelady satisfied that at least to begin? Uh, you, I, I, I would like to thank the uh, chairman. Congress historically has treaded very carefully 
before choosing to interfere in the legitimate law enforcement activities. And the timing of this hearing is unfortunate in that uh, the proceedings have started. And I am confident uh, that the committee's oversight responsibility can be fulfilled today without compromising the integrity of the NLRB's proceedings or the due process rights of private parties. So thank you for clarifying that. And let's go forward. I think we've, we've gotten to the starting point. And again, we will pause the clock if you need to consult on any question, and I will consider changes as necessary. Thank you. Uh, with that, I'm wrung out from asking questions. So uh, I, before I take my round, uh, I already did that. I did that. I'm going to say that. Okay. Uh, we will not. We will now begin, and we'll go right down the row with opening statements. Uh, unlike us, where we hopefully suspended a little bit of what otherwise would have been the long opening statements, uh, you will have up to a full five minutes. When you see, if you can see the, the lights go from green to red to yellow, or yellow to red, please try to wrap it up. Understand your entire opening statement, no matter how long, will be included in the record of this hearing in addition to extraneous material or additional comments you may choose to add later. With that, Ms. Ramick. Thank you very much for being here. I realize that you're not accustomed to this uh, kind of procedure and we didn't help with our opening start. But, uh, please understand, we know you're here as uh, an individual and uh, just be comfortable and say what you feel from your heart. Linda, could you try to move my mic a little closer? <laughs> Cynthia Rainmaker. I am employed. My name is Cynthia Rainmaker. I'm an employee of Boeing based in North Charleston, South Carolina. I am one of the employees who is attempting to intervene in the case involving the Boeing Company, the International Association of Machinists, and the NLRB regarding Boeing's South Carolina operations. In April 2006, I was in the first group hired by Bob aircraft manufacturer with the Charleston facility with assembled the two aft sections of large Boeing aircraft. So when I went to work for the BOD in 06, the IM had not made contact with employees. In 07, IM organizers began soliciting BOD employees with the Boeing War campaign. The union was eventually voted in in the spring of 2008, and after the union got in, we began contract negotiations with BOD. The IM did not inform employees the importance of issues that were negotiated, being negotiated with Bob. At some point, the IM must have known the contract it was negotiating was likely to be rejected because the meeting in November of 08, at which the contract was to be ratified, was billed as a normal union meeting with no mention of a ratification vote. I recall the IM assuring employees that any bad things in the contract would later be improved. Of all the union members in the unit, only 13 attended the contract meeting, ratification meeting. Those few in attendance ratified the, con the IM's contract by voting 12 to 9. All of the provisions of the new IM contract were worse than what we had as bought employees. We lost medical dental short-term disability. The bought employees dissatisfaction with the IM's actions surrounding the contract only increased when the workers were laid off in the following weeks. After the contract ratification, employees attempted to contact IM officials leadership. The IM grand lodge representatives held one meeting and then we had no contact from them for four months during the layoff. Nobody was even able to make contact with them. Around this time, I was voted as the local president and continued in that position until September of 09 when the union was decertified. There was nothing I could do with respect to influencing the union leadership or reassuring the employees about our future 
other new contract with the union. I was not surprised, but the under the labor practice followed the I and the CI were ever against Boeing. To me, they are violating my right to work with a choice. Isn't that what? Isn't that what being an American is all about? A choice, that's my right. They made it perfectly clear to us that they did not want the 787 built here in South Carolina. After Boeing bought the facility, I was aware of a petition being organized to certify the union. And I had no role in that signature gathering for the certification petition. The decertification election was held in September of 2009 the IAM was voted out by a tally of 199 to 69. Recently, the IAM has begun contacting business employees again at the time trying to get them to join. This campaign was very poor in comparison to one several years ago. The Boeing campus in North Charleston is divided into three different production buildings. Building 8819 is currently staffed by 1,200 employees. Building 8820 is currently staffed with about the same. When it is fully staffed, the FAD building, FA and D, will employ some 3,800 employees. Thousands of people will be unemployed if the NORB complaint is successful. Even my job will be catastrophic for myself and the workers in the North Charleston Bowling facility. We are homeowners, we have families that will be affected. And I understand that the NL NLRB General Counsel's remedy in this case will force Boeing to discontinue the final assembly and delivery work in Charleston and transfer it to Seattle. And this will devastate, it will totally devastate our families and the community. It is absolute certainty that many Charleston-based employees, including me, We'll lose our jobs with Boeing in South Carolina if the General Counsel's proposed remedy is adopted. Boeing is one of the best employers in the area, and I would like to continue working for them. But if the 787 program is moved to Washington, I will not accept the relocation offer. I have chosen to exercise my rights as a citizen of the United States to live and work in South Carolina. Our personal experience with IM has been very bad. Although I have nothing against unions in principle, I strongly believe that membership in a union and representation by a union should not be compulsory. We had a union in our plan. The majority of the employees did not want to be represented by that union, so it got voted out. Now it seems we are being punished for that choice. I strongly believe that employers should not be told by the federal government or the union where they can establish their operations. And if Boeing thinks it can get the job done more profitably and successfully in South Carolina, then that's Boeing's decision to make. And I declare in the penalty of perjury that the foregoing is true and correct. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Mr. Rick. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, distinguished visitors, I want to thank you for allowing me the opportunity to discuss the very positive impact that Boeing has had both on my small business and the Charleston community. My name is Neil Whitman. My wife, Melinda, my daughter, Katie, and I own and operate Dunhill Staffing Systems based here in Charleston. In 2000, Melinda and I relocated to the Charleston community with the idea of starting our own business. Like many Americans, we dreamed of, of owning a business. On August 15, 2001, we launched Dunhill Staffing Systems in Charleston. We are a provider of fee paid recruiting for technical and sales professionals throughout the Southeast with a special emphasis on our local market. Some would call us headhunters, we prefer to be called executive search consultants. Our plans for a grand opening on September 17th changed abruptly when our nation was attacked on September the 11th. Despite the shock this had on our nation's economy, my business persevered and was profitable in its first year of operation. As our business grew, I hired more consultants, eventually employing seven full-time staff members. They were well paid and received benefits. We became involved in our local community, including our Chamber of Commerce, SCAPS, our State Personnel Association, the local school district, our churches, and donated time and money to numerous nonprofits throughout the Charleston area. 
My business plan called for the launching of an hourly staffing division, which we did in 2005. Good fortune smiled on us again, and this sector was profitable in one year. The announcement made in 2004 that bought aircraft and global aeronautica were coming to Charleston was indeed good news. Aircraft manufacturing represented an important new business sector for our region. Soon after this announcement, my <coughs> company was contacted about providing services to these companies. Our business volume grew, particularly with global aeronautica, and it grew at a steady pace and they eventually became our largest customer. My decision to launch our hourly division as a hedge against an economic downturn was validated when our search business took a dramatic downturn in the fall of 2008. The ripple effect of the housing market meltdown, the fall of Lehman Brothers, and the stock market plunge combined to virtually kill our most profitable sector. I don't mind telling you I was scared that our business wouldn't make it. Thankfully, companies supporting Boeing 787 program here in Charleston <coughs> continued to grow and this sustained our business through 2009. We placed dozens of individuals with global aeronautica in good paying jobs that offered benefits and the opportunity for many of our contractors to become full-time staff. Many of the people we placed were unemployed at the time with dim prospects for the future. I know they were all glad to have good paying jobs in a tough economic time. The announcement on October 28, 2009 that Boeing had picked Charleston for their new assembly plan was the best economic news in a long while. I knew immediately this was a game changer for our area and offered great potential for my small business. I learned that Boeing was committed to utilizing local resources and that it gave generously to the communities where they were located. All of this proved to be true. After numerous meetings and intense negotiation, my company was added to Boeing's list of national contract labor suppliers and now we get to compete for their business every single day. To handle this additional volume of work, I've added a full-time account manager who focuses exclusively on their needs. The jobs we fill all pay well above the local average and provide an entry point for people to join Boeing as regular full-time employees. My business has grown. We've, we've added over 100 employees and I've seen my revenue grow by 295%. And this is counter to the current job market, which as recent news indicates continues to be very difficult. Once again, if not for Boeing business, my small business would be very different. Mine is not the only small business that's felt the positive impact of Boeing's presence in Charleston. Recently, I had a conversation with an engineer from a local engineering company who told me that without Boeing, they'd be out of business. I have no doubt there are many such stories to be told here in Charleston. If Boeing is forced to shut down their Charleston operations, it would mean the loss of thousands of direct and indirect jobs in the economy but it's just barely recovered from the recession. Again, I don't know if we survive. Boeing has proven, as promised, to be a good corporate citizen. Boeing executives and employees are buying houses, attending our churches, participating in our chambers <coughs> of commerce, and are actively involved in several nonprofits in our area. They've given over $1 million to local charities, and I believe we'll only continue to make Charleston a better community for all of us to live, learn, work, and play. Losing Boeing as a result of this lawsuit was cost thousands of jobs and set our community back for years. When I first heard of this lawsuit, I was more than a little concerned. Many of my friends and business colleagues wondered why and how our government would consider such an action which appeared to be an assault on our free enterprise system. Each and every day, businesses, large and small, must make decisions about where to invest their limited resources. That's what I did 11 years ago when I decided to start my own small business in Charleston. I did so after my research showed Charleston to be a good market, and that decision proved to be a good one. Boeing did the same thing and decided to invest several hundred billions, now a billion, in our community. I believe they did so after carefully considering a multitude of factors, including the positive labor climate in our state. This lawsuit by an agency of our federal government is, in my opinion, against all that makes our economic system special. It will have negative consequences for future generations of entrepreneurs and business leaders who must be able to locate their businesses without the threat of government intervention. The freedom to make these kinds of decisions must be preserved. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of the committee, I am here before you today as the acting general counsel of the National Labor Relations Board, having been appointed to this position by President Obama on June 21st. 2010. 
I would like to start by acknowledging that workers in North Charleston are feeling vulnerable and anxious because they are uncertain as to what impact any final decision may have on their employment with voting. These are difficult economic times, and I truly regret the anxiety this case has caused them and their families. The issuance of the complaint was not intended to harm the workers of South Carolina, but rather to protect the rights of workers, regardless of where they are employed, to engage in activities protected by the National Labor Relations Act without fearing discrimination. Boeing has every right to manufacture planes in South Carolina, or anywhere else for that matter, as long as those decisions are based on legitimate business considerations. This complaint was issued only after the parties failed to informally resolve this dispute. I personally met with the parties, and I tried for three months to facilitate a settlement of this case. I remain open to playing a constructive role in assisting the parties to settle this dispute without the costs and uncertainties associated with extended litigation. I believe that given the parties' long-standing bargaining relationship, a settlement would serve the interests of the parties and the workers and would promote industrial peace. In the absence of a mutually acceptable settlement, however, both Boeing and the Machinist Union have a legal right present their evidence and arguments in a trial and to have those issues decided by the board and federal courts. All charges filed with our regional offices are carefully and impartially investigated to determine whether there is reasonable cause to believe that under the board's precedence an unfair labor practice has been committed. Fairness to the parties and sound development of the law ways in favor of presenting these types of the cases to the board for decision subject to review by the courts. I would not be fulfilling my responsibilities if I turned a blind eye to evidence that an unfair labor practice may have occurred. I took an oath to enforce the National Labor Relations Act and to protect workers from unlawful conduct. The general counsel's concern with fairness to the parties does not end with the issuance of the Throughout the proceeding, the General Counsel remains master of the complaint and is responsible to ensure that the prosecution of the case is justified by the facts and law. As such, it remains open to the General Counsel to make concessions on issues of fact or law and to pursue settlement discussions with the charged party, even over the objections of the charging party. For all these reasons, the actual fairness of the proceedings before the Board and equally important, the perception that the board's administrative processes are fair vitally depends on the public and the parties retaining the confidence that the general counsel is carrying out his prosecutorial responsibilities on the basis of fact and law in the case and is not making decisions on the basis of political or other matters not properly before the board. As you know, the Boeing, Boeing hearing began on Tuesday of this week before an administrative law judge in Seattle, Washington. I am actively involved in overseeing the Boeing litigation and in strategic decisions necessary for the prosecution of this case. My obligation to protect the independence of the Office of the General Counsel and the integrity of the enforcement process restricts my ability to offer insight into the decision-making here. I hope you will share my commitment that these proceedings not be construed as an effort by the Congress to exert pressure or attempt to influence my prosecutorial decisions in this case, which have been and will continue to be made based on the law and the merits and in a manner which protects the due process rights of the litigants. I come here voluntarily out of respect for the oversight role of Congress. I will do my best to answer your questions consistent with my obligations to the parties and to the American public with respect to the ongoing Boeing case. The adjudicatory process must be fair and impartial so that the parties' due process rights, which are guaranteed by the Constitution, are preserved. Our American legal system of justice is guided by these fundamental principles. Thank you. Thank you. Under Ms. Carr. Is that closer? Much closer, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Issa, 
Representative uh, Maloney and committee members, thank you for the invitation to appear today. Uh, I'll start with a pair of opening disclaimers. Uh, my view of the law differs from what is reflected in the complaint that's been issued by the Acting General Counsel uh, against Boeing. Uh, disclaimer number two, this is not the first time different views have been expressed about major business changes. Uh, three factors, in my view, help explain why the litigation against Boeing has resulted in such controversy. Uh, the first factor involves NLRA process. Uh, when dealing with major business decisions, the board litigation resembles a tortoise that can't win any race because the economy now moves at speeds not imaginable when the statute was passed. It's true, the general counsel only decides whether to issue a complaint. And the Boeing complaint does not constitute a finding of unlawful conduct. But the Boeing complaint places a $750 million investment decision on a very long litigation treadmill. And especially when the litigation seeks to have such a major investment redone somewhere else, which might be ordered five or 10 years down the line, the complaint's issuance has immediate adverse consequences. If the board's general counsel acts like a traffic cop. He can issue a citation, but he doesn't write the laws, and he doesn't decide the cases. But traffic citations don't routinely involve impounding the car for five to 10 years. And, and that's the practical effect when an NLRB complaint challenges major investment decisions. The second factor I'll discuss briefly involves the substance of existing law. The NLRA prohibits a relocation <coughs> motivated by anti-union hostility, but the cases in this area require some tangible transfer and removal of pre-existing work. Boeing's assembly plant in South Carolina is new investment that has not involved <coughs> any tangible relocation from somewhere else. Now, one focus in the complaint against Boeing are statements to the effect that South Carolina investment decision, uh, that decision was influenced by past work stoppages at Boeing's unionized facilities in Washington State. Now, those unionized operations had five strikes since 1975. Uh, it included a 58-day strike in 2008, which shut down the Dreamliner production when the program was already 15 months behind schedule. And that strike reportedly cost Boeing $1.8 billion in lost revenues. <coughs> now, companies are permitted to make decisions based on economic costs that exist because of collective bargaining or strikes. So it's not surprising that a company like Boeing, when making a major investment decision, would want to maximize return and minimize downtime. The act prohibits discriminatory relocations, but it doesn't require that employers make irrational decisions about new investment. The third factor I'll mention is the outcome or remedy being sought in the Boeing litigation. Even if some remarks were found to be objectionable, and such a finding has not been made in the case, uh, that would not justify, in my view, the remedial order requested in the complaint. Uh, now, I greatly respect the members of the NLRB. I respect the acting general counsel and, and others that are employed in the agency. But it would benefit everyone if there is some adjustment in the factors that I've mentioned which could accomplish a resolution of the Boeing dispute. Now, I'll close today by mentioning a relocation that was announced on June 10th. I'm not talking about June 10th a week ago. This other relocation was announced on June 10th, 30 years ago, June 10th, 1981. And it took 13 years before that litigation ended. That litigation was called the New Packing Company, and here's what the Court of Appeals said when it reviewed that dispute. This case presents hard questions. Indeed, some of the most polarizing questions in contemporary labor law. While we are sympathetic to the task that lies ahead for the National Labor Relations Board, our sympathy does not lead us to shirk our duty 
to hold the board accountable for the rationality of its decisions. That concludes my prepared testimony. Again, thank you. Uh, I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Professor? <clears throat> thank you. Like all of us who preceded me, I thank the committee for the opportunity to speak to it. Thank you. And it's a large lecture hall, so the, the better, the louder you speak, the better. Thank you. I will take advantage of that. Um, when I agreed to speak to this committee, I started reading up on the Boeing case more than I had previously. And, I, and in my reading, I was struck by the fact that there was an enormous amount of statements made about the case, M many of it by political figures, and many of it uh, by political commentators, and some by law professors, uh, many of whom I knew. Now what was striking to me was the difference in tone between the comments of the political figures and the political commentators and those of the law professors. The political commentators saw in this case something uh, unparalleled, dangerous, very powerful, threatening uh, essentially the capitalist system and the ability of employers to transfer uh, work from one facility to another. And they kept attributing this to the NLRB. Uh, the law professors saw this as a fairly routine Section 8A3 charge by the Labor Board. And I want to identify myself with my fellow law professors. This is not in any way a earth-shaking case. This is a traditional case being decided and um, which should be decided in accordance with principles of law that are over 50 years old. It is well settled, and my colleague to my right does not disagree, that a company may not transfer work for retaliatory reasons. Uh, that, uh, there is a statement to that effect by a uh, judge, which I quote in my testimony, uh, by Judge later Chief Justice Berger. This is in 1967. While it is now clear that an employer may terminate his business for any reason, it is equally well settled that he may not transfer its situs to deprive his employees of rights protected by Section 7. Now the General Counsel alleges that Boeing has taken the steps that it has taken in transferring work from Washington to South Carolina to retaliate against the workers and their, for their activity, for their union activity in Washington. Now, Section 8A3 of the Act, its general purpose has been stated by Justice Frankfurter is to insulate the rights of workers to engage in union activities from their job rights, which means that you may not retaliate against workers or uh, in any way punish them for engaging in union activity. The general counsel alleges that that is precisely what Boeing has done. I have read his complaint and it is filled with quotes from Boeing officials basically acknowledging that that's what they've done. To me, the most unusual thing about this matter is that Boeing has, that officials of Boeing have confessed on numerous occasions to having violated the law. And the general counsel has cited this. It is also the case that the remedy that he seeks is not at all draconian. In fact, he's gone out of his way to state that, um, and I'm quoting from the complaint, the acting general counsel does not seek to prohibit respondents from making non-discriminatory decisions with respect to where work will be performed, including non-discriminatory decisions with respect to work at its North 
Charleston, South Carolina facility. So that while the matter proceeds, there is no doubt that Boeing continues to have the right to transfer work to South Carolina as so long as it's doing so on a legitimate business and not a retaliatory basis. And it is for that reason that the case seems to us, to most of us law professors, myself, Professors Rudney and others, it seems to us a traditional Section 8A3 case. Um, now, there is another, and so we wonder why, in light of the fact that the board is doing nothing unusual, or the general counsel is doing nothing unusual, why is it that there needs to be a hearing by the oversight committee? There is an additional reason for our concern, and that is process, which has been referred to by several of the committee members. Uh, as I point out in my testimony, the NLRB has not decided this case. The general counsel, who is essentially a prosecutor, has discovered enough evidence to proceed. He seems in the we'll, we'll, we'll get to that if you can wrap up, please. Well, uh, all right, but, but I just want to make this point, which I think is important, that there are, if Boeing is correct, and if this is, if the general counsel is correct, there are a whole bunch of legal processes, and these are the processes that are established by law to correct it. We have all of the hearings still pending before the administrative law judge, the labor board itself, and finally in the courts. And it's important to note that Boeing has to take no action until it's ordered to do so by the board. I thank the gentleman.